Hello and um, welcome. Um, my name is Lena Goya. Um, and today I'm going to talk about um, the art from Mogaji Gyu. Um, and I'm going to do uh, my talk in Spanish. So, yes. Uh, Hello and welcome, everybody. I am Lena Goya. I am a PhD student and work in the Technical University of Dresden in Germany. And right now I am researching art in the intersection of ecology. My presentation today is entitled Thinking the Aesthetics of Renunciation Through Indigenous Knowledge, Mogage Gihu, Painting and Narrating La Selva. Now I will try to explain what I mean when I say aesthetics of renunciation. Okay, now let's begin. This is the outline of my talk and as you can see all of the titles are in English and in Spanish. All right, let's begin. Mogaje Gihu was born as Nonuja in 1944 in the Cayunari region in the Colombian Amazon and belongs to an indigenous community that joined the Muinane. We can see the artist here. At the end of the 90s, he and his family were expelled from their village by armed militias. Gihu recounts memories of his ancestors who continued to be displaced or enslaved by the rubber boom until the early 20th century. He himself fled with his family to the outskirts of Bogota where he adopted the Spanish name Abel Rodriguez. Maybe many of you have heard this name before. Here, in Bogota, he met Carlos Rodriguez, director of the Colombian branch of the international NGO Tropenbos, which works to protect the Amazon. Already in the 80s, Gihu worked for Tropenbos and guided researchers through the Amazon forest. His deep knowledge of the flora and fauna was passed down to him orally by his uncle. In his village, Gihu was known as a wise man who shared his knowledge of the ecosystem and the properties of plants with his community. In Bogota, Carlos Rodriguez asked Gihu to paint the jungle in order to document his knowledge. And here we can see him painting. Gihu, who had never painted or drawn before, became a painter and now is an internationally recognized artist with exhibitions in Colombia, of course, Great Britain, Germany, Italy, and Canada, as well as other countries. To date, he has created more than 400 paintings of trees and plants. And here we can see the artist. All his paintings were created from his memories. Now I would like to talk about the term la selva, the rainforest. In my presentation, I would like to focus on the artistic works of Gihu. In order to First, investigate the representation and negotiation of the primeval forest motif or rainforest motif, and two, to investigate the circulation of works in international exhibitions. I believe that both points are in a complex aesthetic-political relationship that I would like to talk about in this presentation. Today, the matter of the primeval forest motif goes hand-in-hand hand with the matter of ecology, sustainability, 
and nature's protection. Nowadays, Greenpeace is once again drawing attention to the destruction of the Amazon and demonstrating the devastating consequences of deforestation for the climate in Brazil, but also beyond the country's borders. The illegal trade in timber has long since gone beyond political restrictions and is mass sold on the European market as the World Wide Fund for Nature has denounced, WWF. In the most recent exhibitions, ecosystems and natural phenomena are thematized, for example, in the depictions of plants and forests, in order to sharpen the vision or the idea of climate change. The aim is to criticize anthropocentrism and the growth society that accompanies it. Mogaji Gihu's works are circulating in these exhibitions at this very moment. For example, here we can see that in Frankfurt, in Germany, there's going to be this exhibition called The Intelligence of Plants. You can see the titles here in English as well. There's also an exhibition in the Netherlands, Saving the Forest, or Save the Forest. And his works were also in the Among Trees exhibition in London last year. And in 2019, his works were in Milan, and this exhibition was called Broken Nature. So these are just some examples that I think are very important to mention. And Gihu's works are always in these exhibitions. At the same time, his drawings and paintings emerge from a complex knowledge, or rather indigenous knowledge, in which the Western concept of art and art institutions are not necessarily accessible or do not even exist. Gihu himself said, and he said it in English and I translated it to Spanish here, and it says, we don't really have that concept, but the closest one I can think of is imitia, which in Muinane means word of power. All paths lead to the same knowledge, which is the beginning of all paths. You can see the original in English here. The figure of the artist acquires a new value in Rodriguez's double personality, indigenous and Western Latin American. And we can obviously discuss those identity categories as well. This value is directly linked to the debate on sustainability which also questions the museum practices of collecting an exhibition. In this way, the indigenous identity of the artist is consciously brought back into the spotlight in the face of climate change and the exploitation of resources. Against this backdrop, one must once again ask oneself under what aspects the appropriation of image and knowledge take shape within the history of images, but also within global art institutions. And one must also ask oneself what consequences this has for the writing of art history. We know that authors such as Nestor Garcia Canclini and Ticio Escobar, among others, have already critically examined the negotiation of indigenous cultures in the context of a Western-influenced concept of art and modernity. They have made several theoretical points that, for lack of time, I cannot go into right now. However, I also think it is necessary to epistemologically broaden the concepts of transculturality, postcoloniality, or the 
global art studies against the background of the ecological debate on so-called climate art. That concept actually does exist right now, climate art. I think that this is necessary in order to be able to adequately describe the phenomenon of appropriation. Therefore, further theoretical considerations are needed to explain how art and the treatment of art in, face, in the face of global climate change is integrated and negotiated aesthetically, but also institutionally. I'm currently working on a theoretical model of an aesthetics of renunciation, which consists of examining the intersections of different forms of existence and life from the perspective of new materialism. But before going into more detail about Mogaje Gihu's work, I would like to briefly discuss a couple of ideas. The term renunciation is currently on the rise in the context of climate change and new ecological awareness, for example, in the sustainable arts. However, it is not an invention of the 21st century. In the German language, it appears as early as the 18th century in Grimm's dictionary as a legal term. To renounce means, first of all, to give up a right. The relationship between aesthetics and renunciation, which was already known in the art of the 60s and 70s through a strong ecological awareness, now reemerges in the current commitment of art to the processes of sustainability. And here we have some examples. These are some of the exhibitions that I've seen down to birth in Berlin last year, Zero Waste in Leipzig, and also the Planet Love Climate Care in the Digital Age. These are all exhibitions that have to do with art and climate change. More and more, art is being used to change previous behaviors in relation to environmental issues. The general question posed by the exhibitions, but also by the artists themselves, is how can we sustainably change the way we work, eat, travel, or exhibit? This is also a quote from the Down to Earth exhibition. So this is the main question that not only artists are asking themselves, but museums as institutions are also asking themselves. It is crucial to understand the current usage and original meaning of the term waiver or renunciation. It refers primarily to the right of a natural person, the legal subject. Today, this legal system is linked to the national state. This means that renunciation presupposes belonging to and recognition of an identity as a subject of law. Only those who possess can renounce. Therefore, the relationship between possession and renunciation must also be examined. And I cannot do so right now due to the lack of time, but that is an important point that we have to keep in mind. The global debate on sustainability, in which the desire for renunciation is inscribed through the critique of the growth society, always starts from the Western subject. That's important. I'm going to re repeat that. The global debate on sustainability, in which the desire for renunciation is inscribed through the critique of the growth society, always starts from the Western subject. The transfer of, I of indigenous identities to the agenda of international exhibitions on climate change and sustainability is highly problematic in view of this supposed 
politics of renunciation. Since the concept of renunciation excludes other forms of life that are not anchored in the Western legal system and the national state. In relation to the politics of exhibitions, these forms of appropriation can be critiqued through an in-depth analysis of the concept of renunciation. At the same time, it is important to examine the artistic practice that emerges from transcultural networks and to recognize and acknowledge the potential of other forms of life in its mode of emergence. By thinking an aesthetics of renunciation, the subject-object relationship expressed in the act of renunciation is not situated in the subject. It is not situated in the subject. Rather, it focuses on the relational perception between environments and perceiving subjects. Or, in other words, through aesthetics, Through aesthetics, the concept of renunciation, which we can by no means vanish as a vital object, vital objective in this time, can be interpreted epistemologically and politically in a, differently or in another way. And from this perspective, I would now like to take a look at Gihu's work. The main motif of his paintings is the primeval forest, La Selva, which Gihu depicts from different perspectives. Here we can see the front view of the Selva forest, including various trees, plants, and animals. In the next image, right here, sorry, I didn't find the title of this piece, but in this image, we see a strong focus on the diversity and individuality of the leaves and the surface of the tree bark. In this case, in this image right here, Gihu shows the jungle from a bird's eye view to represent the river courses and the geographical features. Gihu shows us the jungle from a distance by abstracting the forest and representing it as an ecosystem in its diversity. As you can see in these last images, but he also paints the individual components of the forest, such as the plants, the animals, and their relationship to each other. For example, here you can see some of those images. That is one of the plants called yuca dulce in Spanish, and here we have the pineapple. Thus, an essential characteristic of his paintings is the way the artist treats the forest and the resources available in it. This can be seen, for example, in his paintings about the chagra, the cultivation of plants. And right here we can see a photograph of the chagra and people who work in the chagra. And here he painted the chagra. This was for a the catalog of the NGO we mentioned before. So here you can see the chagra in three months, six months, and it lasts um, a year and a half. It is necessary to find a suitable place for the cultivation of plants, such as yuca, sweet potato, or mafafa, among others. Once the fruits and tubers have been harvested, a new place is found for the next seed so that the soil can regenerate. To do justice to the diversity of seeds, one must know the characteristics of plants. Gihu's images show his complex knowledge which is expressed in the diversity and relationships of plants and their ecosystems. It is also clear that the way of life adapts to this diverse knowledge. Not only the place of the chagra is changed, but also the whole village adapts to the new place and the conditions of the new place. As soon as the rivers flood, people they move to higher ground. This shows us that a piece of land is not managed according to the needs of the people, but the people are managed according to the needs of the rainforests. 
ownership is dynamic. I think that's very important to think about. All of Gihu's paintings are always written in Nonuya and Spanish. There's another example here, so you can see. Thus, text and image are well related. At the same time, the language refers to a knowledge that is located in the indigenous culture, an indigenous knowledge. Through images, other epistemic approaches to nature and its resources are created. The process of decolonization is situated in these other approaches. At this point, I would like to briefly discuss the appropriation of the forest motif in the Latin American context in which colonial history has been inscribed. The virgin forest goes back to a pictorial history closely linked to colonial history. Art historian Marta Penos from Argentina has conducted extensive research on the aesthetic appropriation of territories in relation to the cartographers who arrived in Latin America in the 18th century. In the 19th century, Johan Moritz Rugendas portrayed the jungles of Brazil and Mexico and other countries, I believe, thus shaping the history of the motifs. In his paintings, the colonialist system and power relations are visualized through the strict separation between colonizer and colonized. In his paintings, Luis Felipe Noé dealt intensely with the liberation of this colonizing vision of the landscape and the primeval forests of Latin America. By transferring landscape images from the 17th century and 18th century from Ulrich Schmidl and Felix da Sara, and we can see some of the images here, on top of Ulrich Schmidl and below of Felix da Sara, he was a Spanish cartographer, so, he ch so by doing this, by transferring these images, he changes the narratives about the image of the forest and the appropriation of territories. And I have argued this in my thesis that will be published next year. And although I can only hint at it here, I would like to point out that there is a pictorial history of the forest that predates Gihu's paintings. In contemporary art, the motif of the primeval forest is being transformed and decolonized. Gihu's paintings are an important contribution in this context. Okay, and now this is my last point. As I wanted to make clear, the painting of the forest in Gihu's paintings is closely related to a knowledge of the forest. This knowledge is not situated in the logic of the growth society. In this society, sustainability must be reintroduced as a political and also social concern in the technified world. This is also a concern of the art industry, to put it provocatively. However, it is clear from Gihu's paintings that sustainability is an inherent principle to the way of life. In order to preserve this knowledge of the forest, but also to make it known, several institutions have been founded in the recent years. At the request of the indigenous community of the Inga, the artist Ursula Beeman, in collaboration with Anne Lacaton, has contributed to the cre creation of the Devenir Universidad. 
I have an image here, which you can see, to this university. Another institution that teaches indigenous knowledge is the Intercultural Indigenous Autonomous University of Popayán in southwest Colombia. With all this, I wanted to underline that the idea of renunciation must be transformed through aesthetics, reinterpreting the patterns of perception and experience. In order to do this, we must turn to indigenous knowledge. I'm sure that you have some questions that we can talk about in the session later together. Thank you very much. These are the sources that I used. Yes. Thank you very much. Vielen Dank. Muchas gracias. Vamos a parar.